Hi folks, welcome to another episode of The Hole on the Corner, where we talk all things R.A. Lafferty. I am Dan Peterson, a.k.a. Dr. Rockter. That's my YouTube handle now. It's a character from a Lafferty story. I have a PhD. Technically, I'm Dr. Peterson. I love rock music. I don't know. It's silly, but it's what I chose. It's kind of memorable, I think, so I'm going to use it. So, with this video, I'm beginning a series on where to locate Lafferty in the literary landscape. Um, my PhD was mostly concerned with uh, placing Lafferty as an, as an author of American literature, you know, American lit. And I do think he could fit into like Norton anthologies of American lit. But I wanna talk more about that. I'm gonna do two videos on that. Today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, his relation to Native American storytelling. Okay, now I've mentioned many times that uh, he his work is infused with the tall tale tradition, which kind of comes from the frontier America, uh, American expansion. And I'll talk more about that in the next episode. Um, but it's also infused with Native American storytelling. And I do mean storytelling, you know, coming from the oral tradition, I think it's more complicated than that, but you know, but the storytelling rather than uh, Native American literature, such as you know, 20th and 21st century literature, which I am gonna talk about in the next video when I place Lafferty not only in the tall tale tradition, but as an, a, an author of Western US fiction, where some of the Native American authors I wanna discuss can also be placed. But this time I just wanna talk about that storytelling tradition of uh, Native American, you know, they're often called myths and legends, okay? And they are called this by many Native Americans themselves as well, including contemporary people, but knowing that they mean something different by that than, you know, the Euro settler sort of categories might indicate. Um, but many of them do just call it storytelling or st stories, traditional stories, long ago stories, you know, these sorts of things. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, there's a proviso on the whole myths and legends thing there. Um, and these collections by Richard Erdos and uh, Alfonso Ortiz are so nice to look at with the illustrations inside. Um, the Erdos himself, I think, uh, did. Um, and whilst I think they are super cool, um, I have no idea if they, you know, are anything that Native American people themselves would recognize as in any way authentically representing them or their storytelling traditions or anything else. Look at this guy. How cool! So I think they're awesome illustrations. Um, he's got a bunch more in, in this collection. Um, and I like them, but there are many... Um, Native American artists, uh, older and newer, um, that make illustrations based around traditional, stor uh, traditional storytelling. Um, so, you know, there's not any absolute need for Erdo's illustrations. I do think they're cool, um, but, you know, I don't know if they really have much to do with Native American stuff. Now, here's the thing, too. Now, these guys, I think, tried to do a good job. I, I, you know, there's better and worse versions of sort of collecting and publishing uh, Native American storytelling. Uh, these guys were definitely aiming at something good. You know, Erdos, I think, is sort of Austrian-American and I think lived uh, in Germany around the time of the Nazis and did underground uh, stuff that was anti-Hitler and things like that. You know, I think he's he one of his parents was Jewish. You know, so, you know, he's he's trying to be on the right side of things, I think, you know. Um, and then Ortiz is uh, Pueblo, as well as Latinx. Um, and, you know, of course, so he's trying to do right <laughs> by, you know, his own people and, and so on. Um, but, you know, it, 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 I think it remains to be seen how this is received. You know, and this is from the 80s, 90s. Um, but like, so, for example, in the introduction to this one, I think, they're pretty iffy on how they distinguish myth 
and theory, sort of the mythical world. And it, it, I just don't, I don't think it's totally spot on. On the other hand, in this one on uh, the American Indian trickster tales, I love what they do with specificity um, there because there's this whole thing when you start talking about indigenous storytelling and stuff where everybody wants to slot it in to Jungian ideas and archetypes and into like Joseph Campbell's hero, universal sort of universal myths and hero's journey and all this kind of thing. And, you know, I just I have real problems with that stuff on so many levels, not only ethical and sort of ethno um, uh, ethno, you know, sort of auto ethnography and, and these sorts of things where people tell their own stories. Um, but even artistry, you know, I just don't think it captures, you know, it's, it's like this template that's supposed to fit everything, everything you're ever going to read. And I, I just don't buy that at all. Um, but yeah, but they, but they really, you know, talk about the unique contribution of Native American trickster figures like coyote and stuff. Uh, rather than brush uh, painting with, you know, broad brush strokes. So, you know, there's that. Um, I, I want to bring up this one just because, you know, the title will no doubt make you think of R.A. Lafferty's 900 Grandmothers. Um, and, that, and that illustration there, which is also on the inside, uh, is, is, uh, reminds me a bit of Snuffles. Um, the story Snuffles. Uh, and the illustration that accompanied it in Galaxy when it first came out, which I've mentioned before, you know, that's the size of Snuffles. He's giant, but he's a pseudo ursine. He's more than just, you know, a bear. But regardless, um, but this is also a good example of where you have to be wary about what you're getting into when you grab a collection that allegedly is Native American stories. This is by someone called Nashon. Um, who on the back is, it's revealed, this is a pen name, and that they share a love of American Indian oral traditions. Uh, <laughs> no indication that they are Native American themselves. <laughs> so, you know, grain of salt all the time. You gotta be careful looking at this kind of stuff, what, what, you're, what you're really seeing and getting into. Um, but there are, you know, better collections. Um, now the thing is, a lot of these were still sort of uh, collected, translated, and transcribed by um, anthropologists, uh, Euro settler anthropologists, okay? So, but, but Native American peoples themselves from the different nations like Blackfeet, um, it's Blackfeet in the States and Blackfoot in Canada, uh, you know, and Pawnee and, and whoever, you know, have, have like critically adopted these and said, you know, yeah, there's some problematics about this. However, we do value this as a resource, okay, for our stories. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's cool to look into individual things. You know, like Pawnee is, is the nation of the man and probably Lafferty's most famous uh, Native American-oriented uh, short story, Narrow Valley. Um, and his name is Clarence Little Saddle. I don't know if that... Surname is anything like any Pawnee name, <laughs> old or new. Um, that might, you know, you have to take Lafferty with a grain of salt there, but um, as well as well as anything else, obviously. Um, but yeah, I haven't had a chance to dig into this one in particular. It's one I got when I was uh, working on my dissertation, and I thought I might use, but you know, as you do with so many. Books, you, you, you know, you can only fold in so much to, you know, what you're trying to write and stuff. But uh, one thing I, I gleaned from looking into just a little bit into Pawnee stuff was <laughs> that, you know, uh, the character here in the beginning of the story, he says these allegedly Native American words where he's like, uh, it's, it, it says that, you know, there's this land allotment, which is a historical thing. And... Clarence's father, Clarence Big Saddle, um, you know, hears about this allotment thing and taxes and stuff, and this is what he says. Kit Kahaki, Clarence Big Saddle cussed. You can't kick a dog around proper on 160 acres. And I sure am not here about this pay taxes on land. Uh, and so on. And that, that 
that syntax there is um, Lafferty often will have Native American characters speak in completely uh, quote unquote standard English, but then he will have them speak in a non-standard sort of syntax or grammar. Um, and you can't 100% write that off, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, you know, there could be problems there. And I certainly think of Stephen Graham Jones <laughs> always saying that, like, you know, I want our Native American characters in stories or film or whatever to be able to use contractions, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I think is great. And he's spot on. But, um, but yeah, when he says Kit Kahaki, which I'm, I'm sure I'm not saying right, uh, he does this sort of ritual to create a, a, a kind of trickster quality to, to the valley itself that he occupies. And he, it says, uh, he didn't have any balsam bark to burn. He threw on a little cedar bark instead. He didn't have any elder leaves. He used a handful of jack oak leaves and he forgot the word. How are you going to work it if you forget the word? Petaharat, he howled out with the confidence he hoped would fool the fates. That's the same long of a word, he said in a low aside to himself, but he was doubtful. What am I, a white man, a burr-tailed jack, a new kind of nut to think it will work? He asked, I have to la laugh at me. Oh, well, we'll see. He threw the rest of the bark and leaves on the fire and he hollered the wrong word out again. And he was answered by a dazzling sheet of summer lightning. Skeedy, Clarence Big Saddle swore. It worked, I didn't think it would. Uh, and so on. But these words, Kikahaki, um, Petahaurat, uh, and Skeedy, are actually the names of the three of the four bands that make up the nation of, of Pawnee. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it might sound irreverent for him to just use them like that. However, <laughs> um, this reminds me so much of what I very recently read in Stephen Graham Jones, uh, The Only Good Indians, that has contemporary sort of middle-aged Native American men in it who have a similar approach to performing uh, their Blackfeet rituals <laughs> where they, you know, they only know so much of the language and the details of the rituals or they don't have the right materials at hand and they just make do with what they have. And it's very humorous, um, but meaningful. Um, and I'm not saying Lafferty gets that right. And I'm not saying that Lafferty's even allowed to, to portray that. You know, Stephen Graham Jones is Blackfeet. He can portray that. But all I'm saying is I'm pointing out some resonances there. And that is mainly what Lafferty does with Native American storytelling and culture and so on, is that I don't see him almost ever, if ever, um, like borrow a story from Native American storytelling and fold it into his fiction. What it seems to me is that he has a lot of the flavor of Native American storytelling mixed with other things like tall, tall tales. Um, and not least amongst that would be the humor and, and these sorts of things. And I, I did read online once a uh, review that, that or, you know, it was a comment somewhere on a message board, this was a long time ago, um, that this Native American commenter he said, I'm, I'm, I'm Native American, and I love the story Nar Narrow Valley. He, he, what he said was, whenever I feel a little depressed about circumstances with Native Americans and things, I read this story because I just feel that Lafferty gets in Indian humor, as he called it and as people often call it, I feel Lafferty gets Indian humor right from the inside or something along those lines. Like, that he just... This particular Native American reader felt a, a, a sort of recognition when he read uh, Lafferty's story, um, Narrow Valley. And it's much funnier than that. And it's very, it gets into very um, like sardonic <laughs> um, humor about white settlers from a Native American perspective that like sort of undermines our, our sort of prejudices and things we, we might bring to those encounters and so on. Um, so for what it's worth, you know, that's, I think, a lot of how this kind of stuff comes into Lafferty is more in, like, flavors and stuff. Um, so you've got, uh, you know, other collections I've 
tried to get hold of. Uh, this one is interesting mainly because it's uh, Hold Up the Sky and Other Native American Tales from Texas and the Southern Plains. Um, and it does a number of nations, but you can see here Oklahoma, right there, and it's a little panhandle above Texas and below Kansas, is, uh, is, is part of this, you know, sort of uh, Southern Plains type thing. And I consider Lafferty sort of a writer of the Great Plains and Southwest um, is kind of his, his region. Um, and, you know, in, in here, you know, this is, it seems to be a decent collection. I've seen some Native Americans online reference this as, as a good representation of their stories. Um, I'm not quite as t for sure on this one as I will be with a few others here, but um, there's a story in here called Thunderbird Woman, Skiwees, and Little Big, Big Belly Boy. <laughs> um, and you don't know it from the title there, but it deals with a giant bird uh, that in this they call the Sun Buzzard. And this giant bird is connected with weather and weather patterns. And there's a whole thing, a sort of mythos about, and I use the word mythos advisedly, about this association between this giant monster bird, as it's called, and, and uh, sort of weather and stuff. And that's another good example to me of, of what Lafferty does uh, with Native American storytelling. I've mentioned this story before, collected in a horror, horror collection, which has a much better cover than this. Um, uh, the story is called, Oh Tell Me Will It Freeze Tonight? And it involves weather <laughs> and this giant bird. And there's some Choctaw characters in it. And it's not direct, it's not said this is their storytelling tradition or anything like that. It just has this sort of resonance that reminds me of things I've read in Native American storytelling. Um, so, you know, there's, that's how he does it, I think. Um, which is useful um, <laughs> because I've certainly heard Native American sort of authors and different people discuss, you know, whether non-natives can draw on their storytelling tradition. And I think there's a lot of, there's an ongoing discussion there and there's a lot of ambivalence about it. I think, you know, there's definitely, I think some people that would say just no. And then there's I, many others that would say, well, maybe, <laughs> you know? Um, and obviously they think you should do it with respect and knowledge and understanding and you should have some reason for it. Like, it's not just like, oh, I want to play around in that playground or what have you. So I don't know where, Lafferty really lands with that kind of thing, per se. Um, but it, at the very least, I do know that he doesn't seem very often anyway to draw specifically from, an, a, you know, just fold in a Native American story. So uh, the ones that I've looked at more would be, um, and that I referenced a fair bit in uh, my dissertation, were um, Choctaw and Cherokee, Oklahoma peoples. Although Choctaw come originally from the southeast and then the Trail of Tears, um, and I only say that just because, I only put quotations around that just because, um, not because I don't think it was tragic or whatever, it's just you gotta be careful about making these people the tragic Indians and all that kind of stuff, and I don't think Lafferty really portrays them that way. Um, but anyway, so these are actually interviews and so on with people from the Southeast, um, section of that nation, um, whereas Lafferty would have known the Oklahoma uh, contingent, you know, of Choctaw folks. Uh, nevertheless, the Oklahoma people would have these stories, as far as I understand it. Um, and yeah, there's some really cool stuff in here. Um, so he, he, he gets into, the guy who wrote it, Tom Mould, gets into the genres of Choctaw storytelling. And, and this there's basically two main genres. Uh, there's what are called elders stories, which are more along the lines of sacred or traditional or that kind of thing. And then there's this whole other group called, uh, the term is Shaka Anumpa, which I'm probably not pronouncing right, which translates to um, hog talk. And he says it could possibly be well translated into English as hogwash you know, which we know. And, and just, you know, if you know Lafferty, I feel like that just applies so well. Um, I, I, just to give you the, 
the term here. Shaka Numpa, that's how I pronounce it for now. Um, and this category involves two main uh, sort of elements, jokes and tall stories, and animal stories. Okay, now, jokes and tall stories uses the word tall, um, and he points out how their idea of a tall story or a tall tale um, isn't really that distinguishable from what the general culture and other cultures understand as the tall tale. Uh, amongst themselves, they say, yeah, yeah, it's like tall tales, like what you have, you know. And I have seen that across the board. There's definitely a strong overlap. Insert, I'm going to talk about the differences next time. Um, but there is a strong overlap with just general tall tale storytelling and some of what Native American storytelling does, okay? Um, and, and again, in terms of like the flavors and stuff, so when, when they do these jokes and tall stories in the animal stories, particularly in the animal stories, there's this, what I would call almost a casual violence or, or cr casual grotesquery or the macabre. Um, like there's a, there's a story where, um, I always remember this one, it's just so odd, but Bear has rabbit over for dinner and is making a stew with vegetables. He says, I'm going to add some meat to it eventually. And eventually what he does is he cuts a portion of his own side out and adds it to the stew. And they have it. Then when Bear sees this and thinks this is how a host, sorry, excuse me, Rabbit sees this and thinks this is what a host ought to do. So when Rabbit has Bear over for dinner, um, he's making a stew. It's got vegetables. He's like, oh, I'll add some meat. And he goes to cut himself in the side and it says he didn't realize he was way too small for that. So he stuck the knife in and he died. <laughs> and I know, I know it's like, I'm laughing, like why, that's not funny. But they, they stipulate quite specifically that if Shaka Anumpa don't make you laugh, they haven't done their job. You know, the story hasn't done its job. So, you know, there's a, there's a comic grotesque sort of humor that I just think is, is native, also native, you know, is inherent also in, in Lafferty's fiction. Or another example is uh, there's, um, it's like, I think it's like how rabbit got his loose skin. And um, the wild cat is, asks the rabbit to give him a good scratch. And then the rabbit says, now give me a good scratch. And he keeps telling the wild cat, harder, harder. So the wild cat like lets out his claws and just scratches really hard and just pulls his whole pelt off, pulls all his skin off. And then it says, and that's why the rabbit's skin is loose. <laughs> You just kind of to assume, I guess, he put it back on after that. But, you know, that kind of like sudden, grotesque, um, casual sort of humorous violence is, you know, all over Lafferty and all, sometimes in relation to animals and, and these sorts of things. And it just, again, that's the sort of like flavor um, that, that I recognize in Lafferty when I, when I read these things. So with, uh, I've mentioned this one before. I've highly recommended it. I, I think the, the Christopher Tootin is Cherokee and he is talking with Cherokee elders and they're telling stories and they're called the um, Turtle Island Liars Club. Turtle, Turtle Island is the native term for what we call the USA or, or, or I think North America. Um, and uh, they're called the Liars Club because uh, their term in Cherokee is Gagoga, which I probably also am not pronouncing right. Um, which means lying or storytelling. Um, and so th that's what they do. They do gagoga. And, uh, and they la as they discuss it in the beginning, you know, they're laughing about it. They're like, you know, it's humorous that we call this, these lies and that we're liars, you know, as storytellers and this kind of thing. And that, that directly crosses over into the tall tale, which are called lies and tall tale storytellers are liars and that kind of thing so that you know and again and Lafferty uses that all the time like people who are spinning yarns he calls he says they're telling lies they're liars you know and and generally it's a good it's an approbation it's a good thing you know um but these stories also sort of uh collect um uh sort of traditional Cherokee stories this is an earlier collection of Cherokee stories which he does value but this kind of like supersedes it to a certain degree but this is quite good um friends of thunder by the by um a husband and wife team the kilpatricks it was a 
respected book, this kind of up, updates it. And in addition to the traditional stories, um, it has uh, uh, contemporary stories that they tell. And it's, it's the way that they talk in here, the elders in particular, remind me so much of Lafferty himself, of Lafferty's Native American characters, up to and including their syntax and grammar, which he records quite faithfully. Um, and they do talk in this, some of them talk at times in this kind of non-standard, quote unquote, non-standard English or a diverse way of speaking English, um, which is really cool. And it's really interesting to see that kind of resonance too. But this has, uh, you know, illustrations by an actual Native American person, America Meredith. Um, and I've seen a few of her things online as well uh, that I thought were pretty cool. Um, that's some of the... Uh, the elders chatting away. And when I say elders, you, you know, these are like really cool average guys, you know, with a diversity of sort of background and stuff. Not average, I mean, they're remarkable, but you know, they're just down to earth guys. Um, Oklahoma guys. This is a great story from other cultural hero heroes. Um, Sola Gay, which I don't, again, I don't think I'm pronouncing right. Um, but yeah, um, he, he, he rescues, this is a cool thing about Native Americans and monsters and the monstrous, you know, which, which uh, Tutin specifically addresses in here, that the Western idea of the monster is kind of this like abomination, this mixture that is horrible that you need to, you know, fight or whatever. And he's like, monsters are way more complicated than that in, in Native American thought. And uh, so, for example, you will have evil monsters that do harm that do need to be fought in some way but you also have like monstrous sort of mixtures and stuff in like a cultural hero like Soligay with a snake head and and wings and things but he liberates them from these sort of like wizard these wizards type people wizard tribe that kind of tries to take them over for a little while um but yeah so there's all kinds of illustrations that's a funny one about how the rabbit got his long back legs and ears that the creator pulled them out <laughs> at his request, but then didn't finish. And so he has short four legs. Um, yeah, and this is a cool monster. Um, the, oh, what's he called? Uk Uktan, sort of a, uh, like a serpent dragon type thing um, with a jewel in its head. And it is evil, but what he also says in here about monsters is that even the evil ones, there's, there's usually something to learn from them one way or the other, uh, and that they, they and or their remains and these kinds of things can like be medicine, you know, can give wisdom and, and so on. So monsters are complicated, and even that I find very reflected in Lafferty. You'll see how he uses even the word monster, and sometimes it's it's evil, sometimes it's neutral, sometimes it's um, one of the quote-unquote good guys, you know, uh, etc. So, you know, that's, that's all I'm going to say about Native American storytelling. There's some good resources there, and I just, if you try it out, tell me if you think you taste that same flavor in a lot of what Lafferty does. Um, the thing then also about Lafferty and Native Americans, of course, is that Lafferty loves history. He's interested in history full stop, but he's particularly also interested in, in Native Americans as historical people, contemporary people, his neighbors, and so on. And most of, in the short stories and some other places, most of his Native American characters are just contemporary, average Oklahoma or Southwestern sort of people. Um, but he, of course, he wrote a historical novel of the Choctaw people. Um, and this makes me think of Black Elk Speaks, um, which... I mainly got into originally just for this chapter three, this power vision or great vision that he has that is one of the most, one of the best visionary literature pieces I've ever read. Millions of horses plummeting out of, multicolored horses plummeting out of the sky and just that's the beginning. The whole red road type thing um, is in there. But he, this was, you know, there's a, a Euro settler poet, John Neihart, uh, who sort of transcribed this and stuff. And I think, you know, there's newer critical editions that I haven't got hold of yet that maybe do some more work trying to recover a little more of what uh, Black Elk himself may have said rather than some of the 
embellishments that Nehart might have, have given to it. Um, but uh, yeah, but the rest of the novel is, uh, or book, is telling uh, Black Elk's whole story, life story, and it's kind of sad um, in a lot of ways to me. Uh, um, and Lafferty is not massively invested in, like I said, the tragic Indian either. This is a famous book, which I have not read, uh, a history book. And Dee Brown wrote a claim about Lafferty's Oklahanali. So I don't, I can't vouch for this book. Uh, you know, I think at one time it was pretty valuable um, in Native American studies. I, I imagine it's somewhat outmoded now. I think it's from the 70s. Um, but yeah, but Lafferty writes of Native Americans as both historical and contemporary living people. And, and I think that's when I'm thinking about him uh, drawing on Native American storytelling tradition, it's important to remember these are real living people. And the thing about Native American storytelling that's very important as well, when I mentioned that they, they do like contemporary stories here and stuff, is that um, it's very, the storytelling is very much a living tradition. Um, and I think sometimes one of the best ways to, to read Native American stories is to see how they're folded into, and I'll talk about this a little more next time, but uh, contemporary 20th century, 21st century Native American authors and like the novels they write and stuff. And I, I, I referenced this a fair bit in my dissertation, The Way to Rainy Mountain by N. Scott Momaday, which is biographical about his trip to Oklahoma to visit his grandmother. And uh, he folds in a lot of Kiowa um, stories. Uh, and these are his illustrations. Um, and uh, so that's a really great way to, and, he, and he, you can see exactly in this book how Native Americans use that tradition to like interpret their life and, 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 and in, um, inform their existence and, and things like that and how they are fresh and alive, the stories and, you know, developing and applying in different ways and these sorts of things. And uh, it, it's really cool for that. And, and I've seen that in other traditions. Even, again, look at that. That's a really cool creature. And again, this whole, the monsters or the monstrous in here is, again, that more complicated, like, not just like, oh, these are evil monsters. It's more like primal forces and, and other things, you know, that we need to interact with. And that's something else that Christopher Tootin says is that, you know, there's this kind of three-tiered, idea of the universe of the sky world our middle world and the underworld which is not like a hellish place but it is dangerous <laughs> and it's full of monsters it's a watery world full of that oceanic monstrousness um that is meant it partly energizes our middle world and we can we need to interact with it and it informs our creativity and that kind of stuff um so you know and again i see that kind of attitude from lafferty in his stories um, but yeah, in, you know, even in this, I see uh, Jones interacting with Blackfeet stories, particularly blood, blood clot or blood. Cl wow, I never realized how hard that is to say out loud. Blood, cl <laughs> blood clot boy, or sometimes just called blood clot. And he even does a cool implied gender thing with that toward the end here. Um, sort of a, a hero from Blackfeet stories. And actually, Blood Clot or some, something similar to him, you see again in some of the other um, native nations, which there, of course, is cultural overlap between these peoples, though there is also very much distinction. Um, so yeah, so I, I do think Lafferty saw Native American storytelling as a living tradition. Um, whether he had any right to in any way be involved with Native American things or not, is up for Native American readers to, to decide. All I can do is sort of point out what I see might be happening there and some resonances and things. And, you know, for what it's worth, maybe it's not worth a lot, I don't know, but it is actually through Lafferty that I got so into Native American studies and Native American. Mainly, you know, I'm, I'm a literature guy, so I'm interested in the stories, the storytelling, the literature, but through that, you know, to understand that, you need to understand so much more than that in history and things. So, you know, it got me into it. It got me, even if he's problematic about it, it got me past him into the sources. Um, 
Again, I'm not saying that makes it cool for him, but it's, it, there's an interesting conversation to be had there. But like I said, he's interested in history, interested in a, a, Native, Amer a Native American view of American history, which is what um, the Cherokee Chickasaw novelist uh, Geary Hobson said in his introduction to Oklahonali is that Lafferty represents a Native American view of like Oklahoma history. And he says that approvingly. He's like, he, in the 70s, considered Lafferty an ally. You know, for what it's worth, you know, at that time. I, I don't know what people will think now. But in addition to the, the storytelling the, and, and Native American peoples as historical, I think I see resonances in Lafferty with Native American thought, Native American philosophy and worldview. Okay, and I think some of it is conscious and some of it is imbibed. I think that for whatever reason, Lafferty saw sort of people like Irish Americans and Native Americans and probably some others um, as somehow uh, naturally allied or if not naturally, you know, they could be. Uh, let me see if I've got where to go. Found it. <laughs> in Lafferty's The Reefs of Earth, these essentially Irish American kids, uh, the Dulantes, who are puka, which are aliens from another planet, but that is a term for Irish goblins. Uh, and, um, you know, they're the Dulantes. They're definitely stand ins for Irish Americans. You know, when their parents are in trouble with authorities and different things, uh, it's a local Native American woman who comes and, you know, shelters them and takes them to a safe place and different stuff. Um, and later, <laughs> they, one of the places they hide is a Native American burial ground. And again, you know, I need Native American readers to read this stuff and see what you make of it. But they go, first of all, there's like this deep time thing about like um, extinct animals and stuff and their bones and things. And then in the mound, the the... Native American ancestors are very much alive and they're, you know, smoking and storytelling and these sorts of things. And the kids kind of stay there for a little while. It's as storytelling, as fiction, it's an awesome passage to me. It's one of my favorite things I've ever seen. Um, you know, again, is it appropriation or whatever? I don't know. Let, let's have that conversation. But again, as an example of how he ranges around, he's got, you know, this Burial Mound, which suggests history and, and ancestors and things. He's got this contemporary woman. I think her name is Phoebe. And it does say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm totally blanking on, on her nation. I want to say Shawnee, but I am really not positive at this moment. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, Shawnee. <laughs> so yeah, Phoebe helps shelter them. And she's a contemporary character. They actually play with and kind of roughhouse play with some local kids, Cherokee and others. And uh, also there's this part where the one of the dads of the Dulantes, because um, it's, it's two couples, one of the dads uh, goes into a bar. He's on the run and he goes into a bar, which is, happens to be filled with Native American men. And he kind of describes them as being like having a wry look in their eyes and stuff, uh, whatever. But one of them gives him a lift and I seem to recall in like sort of a muscle car or some kind of cool car and they kind of have a chase and stuff. He drives fast. And this character it's revealed as, you know, they like have a conversation or something. And he's like a mechanical engineer. He's like a young man. And I think he's he studied mechanical engineering at the, one of the Oklahoma universities or whatever, you know? So it's like, you know, that's the range that Lafferty has with who his native American characters are and these sorts of things. So as to the interest in Native American thought, you know, for example, in this book, it deals a lot with Native American thought and philosophy. There's this um, essay called by uh, Brian Burkhart, What Coyote and Thales Can Teach Us, An Outline of American Indian Epistemology. And he looks at the figure of Coyote and the mistakes he makes and the humorous mistakes he makes and how we learn from that. And... Essentially, you know, we learned that to be out of proper relationship with everything else is 
is what causes you know trouble <laughs> and harm and that kind of informs a Native American view of epistemology and how we know things um, and again there's just that sense of that sort of coyote comic type figure that gets into the trouble that we learn from that again I just see stamped all over uh, Lafferty's work but also he, he says some cool stuff here about um, he says that so he's talking about Descartes and his his cogito, cogito, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. He says, the cogito ergo sum tells us, I think, therefore I am. But native philosophy tells us, we are, therefore I am. A native philosophical understanding must include all experience, not simply my own. If I am to gain a right understanding, I must account for all that I see, but also all that you see and all that has been seen by others, all that has been passed down in stories, and so on. And Lafferty is absolutely fascinated with seeing the world and ways of seeing the world and diverse ways of seeing the world and how everybody sees it differently. Look at his story through other eyes this is one of the clearest examples, but it's like all over his fiction and, and this whole like ways of seeing and acquiring good ways of seeing and better ways of seeing and all this kind of stuff is, is big in Lafferty and very much that sense of we, I mean, that sense of we, we are, therefore I am. I mean, that, honestly, you could, you could say that's what Lafferty's fiction says. Um, you know, it could be summed up in that way in terms of philosophy. There's a multiplicity, a plurality um, that's ontological in Lafferty's fiction. And it's communal. Um, and, and he also goes on to say, if it is we, capital W, if it is we that is first and not I, then what counts as the data of experience is quite different. So we need more data than just what we can give ourselves. If it is through the body or the people the understanding arises, then no one part needs shape this understanding. All the experiences of all the parts should be brought into process, into the process of understanding. Um, and I've seen in other sort of Native American thought that that is more than human as well and includes kinship, includes non-human animals and just non-human things, you know, rivers and mountains and things. And, uh, and you get some of that. There's a, th there's a Native American writer called Vine Deloria that reminds me so much of Lafferty somehow. He's, he's got this irascible sort of quality to him, irascible and erudite, you know? Uh, and just the way he talks and the way he thinks reminds me of Lafferty. And also he has this view of like what's behind us and maybe what we've lost from that. And that's a big thing for Lafferty. And I know a lot of that can be conservatism and reactionary, um, maybe not always in the best way, um, but uh, you know, there is resonance with other points of view, like indigenous views about what we've lost um, and that kind of thing. And this, you know, is re remembering the powers of the medicine men and the things he says about interactions with, again, animals, weather, and all kinds of other things reminds me so much of what you see in Lafferty's fiction. And again, like Lafferty ha like has this huge critical engagement with Jung. Like he didn't think Jung got everything right, which is a Good attitude to have, but he found that psychology interesting, and, and Vine Deloria is interested in Jung as well, and you know compares that to his Sioux background, and says, "Look, Jung got some things right, but let, you know some things wrong, and and you know here's the Native American view of that same kind of thing and stuff." And again, I just I just see that so much in in Lafferty's fiction. So that very roughly is a sketch of how I see Lafferty's relation to Native American storytelling, history and culture and worldview and the way it informs his fiction. And, and now that I've said that, when I talk about his works in future videos, quote from them, I hope that we'll be able to see, you know, just how, how it's so deeply woven in uh, rather than like, I, I borrowed this bit and that bit. It's just kind of woven in there and you get some of the flavor of this Native American storytelling. So thanks, you know, it, this, <laughs> I realize this series may not be for everyone. So for those who enjoyed it and stuck with it, thank you and please let me know what you think. Um, and if you can bring anything to this from knowledge of Native American studies or if you yourself are Native American, I would greatly appreciate your input. 
Uh, and next time we're going to move on to some more stuff about American literature, the tall tale and U.S. Western literature. Thanks so much, guys.